Good morning and welcome to our service of worship from the Pendleton Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you are worshiping with us, however it means. We hope that God's blessing will extend to you today. There are some announcements I remind our congregation who are receiving our bulletin information via emails. I encourage you to read them and participate, particularly in the prayer list and also for those who are serviced by the Clemson Community Care, uh, we are in need of some items for them. As you know, we uh, subsidize through them through our mission program. So if you have items, then you may come by the church office on Tuesday, Thursday, or Friday morning and uh, after nine o'clock, and we'll have it open for you to deliver those here. Let us now begin to worship and use the prayer of confession that you have also received. O Lord Jesus Christ, who gave your life that we might receive pardon and peace, mercifully cleanse us from all sin and keep us evermore. For we acknowledge our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Amen. And now the words of assurance. Almighty God freely pardons all who repent and turn to him, remitting all our sins through the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus, our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our hymn is All Things Bright and Beautiful. Thank you for continuing to support your church through your offerings of tithes and gifts. Please join me, if you would please, in the prayer of dedication for the offerings that you have given. Source of deliverance and help, we offer ourselves to you in response to Christ's call. Out of the abundance of your love, we offer gifts to you. Accept the gleanings of our labor as we set them before you. Amen. Our reading this morning from the Old Testament is taken from the book of Jeremiah, and I shall read to you from the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 6, as you hear the word of God, God's word to the people of Israel about restoration after the exile. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord, Therefore says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, 
and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And with God's word ringing in our hearts and minds, let us come before God in prayer beginning in a moment of silence while you offer the prayers that are in your hearts. Let us pray together. And now let us join together in prayer Shepherd God of Israel, who sent Jesus into the world to be the shepherd of the church, we thank you for his love which guides and nurtures your people. He cradles us in his arms and brings us back to the fold and to safety. He leads us to pastures where quiet streams flow. In the waters of baptism, we are made members of his fold. In the breaking of bread, we are strengthened. The cup passes among us is the sign of new life. The old find consolation, the young are granted visions. We thank you that we are in the flock of our Lord Jesus, the Good Shepherd. He names us and he calls us to walk with him. He leads us on the journey our life will take us as his followers. He teaches us what it means to obey. By his judgment, we will know when we have strayed. By his mercy, we will be saved from foolish ways. By your mercy, we pray, teach us the meaning of true righteousness. Help us to know what it means to serve your people in need. Where there is hunger, let us be thankful to offer bread. Where others thirst, let us be thankful to offer water in the name of Christ. Though through us may the stranger find a place to stay and the tattered and the naked be clothed. May our thankful ministry serve as the keys to your kingdom, unlocking the gates so that your people enter the sheepfold. There they may find shelter and grow in the faith and obedience as followers of him who fulfilled all of your will and taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this morning from the New Testament is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew. And I shall read to you from the sixth chapter, verses 25 through 34, as you hear again the word of God. Here our Lord is advising us not to worry about many, many things. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? 
And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, you of little faith do not worry, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of God. Thanks be unto God. And we pray through our Lord Jesus Christ that our understanding might be added. In the days that we have lived through this past year and before that even, before we suffered with the pandemic, I wonder if there are any two words in our lives that can cause more worry than the words, what if? What if? What if this could happen to us? What if our future is not what we had hoped for it to be? And we begin to speculate about possibilities of this thing or that thing happening. And soon, it does not matter that the well of our life beside us is full and has always been full. Thinking thoughts such as these, we can become frozen about what might happen to us, what might happen to the future, or what might indeed be asked of us. How do we get away from thinking thoughts and not concentrating upon God's word to us that we are all right, we will be all right? At the intellectual level, the answer is obvious. What we need is an attitude of trust and confidence in the future based upon what we have experienced in our past. I used to be reminded of this every day. When I served this congregation, this church some 40 years ago, I, brought, I bought a plaque, something that I, I don't think I've ever done before or since. And I put it of all places near the mirror in the main bathroom in what was the manse where we live. It's gone now, of course, but it was entitled A Morning Prayer. And it read, nothing can happen today that God and I cannot handle together. That, my friends, I believe is trust. To be confident about what lies ahead for your day, your life, your future. To believe that you and the very God that created you can really counter all of the anxiety in our lives if we would simply remember what we have been told through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This leads me to a, a question as they always seem to do. How can we take this trust that is offered to us in our scripture, in our Bible, and make it more of a reality in our lives? It has to be more than just a concept or a matter of words. It needs to be as tangible as it can possibly be. Some years ago, I read a sermon in which the pastor who gave the sermon talked about doing life not on a trapeze, holding on for dear life, but rather 
doing your life, living your life as if you were sitting in a swing, moving back and forth, being held up. Think about those two devices for just a moment. In a trapeze, if you were on one, you have to hold on for your life. The only thing that is saving you from a fall is your own hold on that bar. And if that is not a useful illustration that came to me long ago of what anxiety feels like, I don't know what one would be, but a swing. Oh, now that, that's a different proposition altogether. A swing holds you up. It supports you as you swing back and forth into space. This is the image of trust. And the practical question for us is, how do I shift that image in my mind and make the positive a reality in my life? What could move me to understanding life not as a trapeze act, but rather as a ride and a swing? I have a suggestion. My conclusion is this, that gratitude, being grateful for what we have received in life, can be a way of turning our lives from a trapeze act into a swing ride why do I say it? Because I think more than anything else, being grateful for what we have received, gratitude is a form of raising our awareness about what we have received, where we have been, and what we can expect in the future. It invites us to think of the future in this life rather than in fear. It is how our Lord Jesus attempted to cope with the anxiety in our text. He invited people to simply observe what is going on. Look, he said, at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. The whole of nature is being sustained by the grace and the sufficiency of our Creator God. Now talk about life lived in a swing mode rather than a trapeze mode. What better way to describe it than birds that do not worry, flowers that do not toil, nor do they spin. Rather, it is our God's hold on them, not their hold on God, that is the key here. And we humans, our Lord Jesus said, are more precious to God than all of these. So we are invited to live our lives in that kind of trust. We are to do so because the God loved us so much. He gave us his only son that we might have this understanding of life and gratitude, being grateful is the way of becoming aware of this reality in our lives. The writer, I think, of the uh, 103rd Psalm was absolutely correct when he wrote, when we forget not God's benefits, a whole new perspective begins to open up about our future. Surely this good God who has given us good old days can be counted upon to give us good new days as well. If goodness and mercy have followed you all the days of your life and gratitude makes us conscious of this, why not trust that same goodness for your future? Nothing is going to happen today or down the road that God and you cannot handle. How do I believe this? Because I look at what God has done for us, for me, in the past, and that awareness brings to me a sense of gratitude and hope. And hoping becomes the basis for courage and confidence. And it goes all the way back to when 
we choose to count our blessings and we name our blessings one by one and we become astonished all over again not just at what God has done but what God can be counted upon to do in the future I think that is a crucial part of our national heritage as a people of God and I think that in many ways many ways we have forgotten that and it has led us to much grief and distress what we need I think more than anything else is a sense of trust that looks ahead and says nothing is going to happen today or tomorrow that you and God cannot handle together choosing to be grateful that is a way of becoming aware of everything that has been and everything that you can expect to happen in your life for goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our lives and the good God who gave us good old days can be counted upon to give us good days in the future as well our, our, as Christians, our answer should be, oh, yes, yes, that's true. We have the free-hearted earth as our mother. We have the God of all that is as our father. And gratitude, being grateful, makes us aware of all of this. So, as the old illustration I found advises, let us swing forth, not in fear, but in a great hope. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, if you would please, let us affirm what we believe by repeating together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn is, This is My Father's World. My friends, from this time that we have shared together, apart from the world, 
I charge you to carry the peace of Christ with you, remembering from where we came, we have been sustained in love, and we will be sustained in love in his grace and peace forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>